What is going on everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Richard on Data. So if this is your first time here, my name is Richard and this is the channel where we talk about all things data, data science, statistics, and programming. So subscribe for all kinds of content just like this if you haven't already and hit the notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I upload a video. So we're going to do an R tutorial today on data visualization with the package ggplot2. Now this is not the only visualization package in R. In fact, base R, before you include any other packages, has some visualization features to it, but this is absolutely by far the most popular visualization library in R. Now, I did a tutorial just a few days ago on dplyr, and you don't necessarily have to watch that one before this one. I'm going to try to go through this tutorial and assume you have as little R knowledge prior to this as possible, but I do recommend going through and watching that one first, just because data visualization tends to be a little bit downstream of data manipulation. So you need to do data manipulation and wrangling and changing things around oftentimes before you have a data set that's in an appropriate format in order for you to visualize. So whether you're here after watching the uh, deployer video or not, let's get started. Before I do that though, please smash the like button because that really does help my content reach a larger audience. Also, I do have a link in the description of this video to my Patreon account. So if you guys are willing to support me there, that would be massively, massively appreciated. All right, so we're gonna make use of two key packages here, and those are the Tidyverse and GG Theme Assist. So the Tidyverse is a broad set of packages. It includes dplyr, it includes ggplot2, it includes a variety of others that are useful, and it's just really good to get in the habit of calling the Tidyverse library rather than all of those packages individually. And then you're gonna see GG Theme Assist at the end of this video. That's basically gonna make it super quick and easy to make whatever kinds of themes and just aesthetic characteristics to your graph that you could want. So just at a high level overview of ggplot2 graphs. So all of them are going to include at least three key components. And those components are number one, data, number two, an aesthetic mapping, and then geomes, that is objects. So you just map something to an X and to a Y or something like that and create some kind of objects on that and you have a basic graph. Now optionally, these graphs are going to include other components like stats, that is transformations, scales, facets, other coordinate systems, position adjustments, or themes. And we're gonna go through all of those examples in, uh, in this tutorial. But these three are the keys in which any graph created through ggplot2 is gonna have. So just a little bit as a disclaimer, this code is going to be heavily adapted from the book R for Data Science by Hadley Wickham and Garrett Grolemund. I highly recommend checking it out. The link to that is in the description of this video as well as in this script. Also, the ggplot2 cheat sheet is amazing. That's going to be linked as well. And then this script itself, if you want to follow along with it and access it, that's in my GitHub repo, also in the description of this video. All right, so we're gonna start this off by creating the most basic and simple scatter plot that we can. And how any graph in ggplot2 is gonna to come together is, you're going to start by calling the function ggplot, and then you're going to add to it another function, which is going to begin with the word geome. So the intuition here is we're calling geome point. That's the function in ggplot2 for creating a scatter plot because the object on the graph when you have a scatter plot is just points across a graph. And so this is different from something like dplyr or a lot of other tidyverse uh, packages because we're using a plus here instead of the pipe operator, but it is what it is. And the data set that we're using here is the MPG data set that's built into the ggplot2 package. So with this, we're using ggplot with data equals MPG. And then geom point, we're going to pass to it this function AES. This is always what we're going to do with ggplot2 functionality. And AES, that's just our aesthetic mapping. And we're going to pass an X variable and a Y variable. So we want the variable DISPL on the x-axis and the variable HWY going to the y-axis. 
So we do that and bam, we've got ourselves a pretty basic, not the most you know pretty looking, but a functional scatter plot. And now just one comment, the data argument and the AES uh, function, they can go to either ggplot or to geompoint. It really doesn't matter at all if you have only one data set. And actually if you pass both of them to geompoint, that gives you a little bit more flexibility in the event that you're using multiple data sets and everything's just going to one graph. But in this case here again, it doesn't really matter. Now that we've got this basic scatter plot up and running, the next question you're probably asking is, well, okay, that's great, but now how exactly do we make this thing look good? Well, it's important to understand that the AES function takes way more potential arguments to it than just X and Y. So geom point specifically understands the following aesthetics. Those are X, Y, alpha, color, fill, group, shape, size, and stroke. And you can see all these things just by looking at the help documentation. So I have that up on the bottom right side, and maybe my face is in the way so you can't see it too thoroughly here. But if you always scroll down in this help documentation, you're going to be able to find the available aesthetics that you can pass to that, uh, to that function. So one of those is color, and let's try that one out here. So first of all, just to get an understanding of what this data set actually looks like, if you take a look here, you see you have this variable called class. So what if we make the different classes each have their own individual color? Well, what we could do inside of the AES function is pass that variable class to the argument color. Let's run that and bam. Look, two seeders get their own color, compact gets their own color, etc., etc. So this is looking a lot better. But one thing to keep in mind here is this is not the only way that you can specify color. We were very specific here to specify color inside of the AES function. But if you do it outside of the AES function, you can manually specify what color that you want. So I'm going to try a couple things here at once here. To the size argument to AES, I'm going to pass the variable class, and then I'm just going to have everything in the color blue. Bam. So I don't necessarily like this kind of graph because it's hard to visualize the graph and get a feel for what's exactly what. But class corresponds to a different size and everything's blue. So again, it looks better. Next, let's see some other examples of graphs that you can create using ggplot2. So the next thing that I'm going to create is a bar chart. So going down here to create a bar chart, the function that we're going to use is geom bar. And to the AES function here, we're going to pass the variable class. All we want and all that you're really getting from a bar chart is counts for each individual class. And ggplot2 is automatically going to tabulate those for us. We're going to run this and bam, we have a bar chart or technically in this case, it's technically a column chart. What we've got here is the individual classes on the x-axis and then the counts on the y-axis. But you may look at this and then you say, well, I don't want the counts, I want to see the proportions. So going from a count to a proportion is a kind of transformation. And oftentimes these kinds of stats or transformations are built directly into ggplot2 and we can do them very quickly and easily. So if we add this code here, instead of just x equals class, we add y equals stat, in parentheses prop, and then group equals one. If we run this, all of a sudden now we have basically the same looking bar chart or column chart that is, but now instead of counts on the y-axis, we have proportions. And I'll just scroll through these so you can see the the bar charts look exactly the same, it's just now instead of a count, we have a proportion. And this is where I'll be honest with you guys and let you know, I don't always remember the exact syntax for this kind of thing. This is one of those things though that if you Google it, or even if you look on the cheat sheet a lot of times, you will easily and quickly find this kind of syntax. So we've covered bar charts, aka column charts in this context. The next graph that we're going to create is a histogram. So the only real difference between a bar chart and a histogram is that a histogram takes a continuous variable as its argument. So let's try this here with the uh, function geom underscore histogram. So here we have a histogram of the variable hwy. 
and you'll see pretty quickly that this is not the prettiest looking graph. So that's the thing, you have to configure these things quite a little bit inside of ggplot2 in order to get them to look good. So one particular argument that Geom Histogram takes is the argument bin width. And that's just how big do we want these bins. You can specify how many you want by specifying the bins argument, but you typically aren't going to want to do that. It's a lot more intuitive because it's closer to what your data actually looks like and that kind of scale that you may be familiar with, just to specify bin width. And the two also key arguments which you'll want are fill and color. Now fill will actually specify the real color. The color just sets the color of the border. So let's run this. We've got bin width, fill, and color in this context outside of the AES argument because we don't want to pass uh, different mappings to AES. We don't want the color to be based on another variable. We just want to set it manually. And bam, we've got this navy and gold histogram. And this looks a lot better. Even though this graph looks a lot better, there are still some things to it that I'm not a huge fan of. First of all, the x-axis, it automatically has breaks in units of 10. Now, it did that automatically, even though the bin width is 5, but I don't like this. I'd rather the axis have breaks in units of 5. And also, not only does this graph not begin at the origin 0, 0, 0 isn't even included on the x-axis. So, we want to fix all these things, and this is a great example to modify the scale of this graph. And so we're going to do that by using the two functions scale x continuous as well as scale y continuous. And there are analogs to this. Like if you had a discrete variable on the x-axis, you would use scale x discrete, etc., etc. But we have a continuous variable here. So there are a few key arguments that we want to feed scale x continuous and scale y continuous. And those are breaks, limits, and expand. The breaks, we're going to just manually specify what we want the breaks to be. And we're going to use the SEQ, that stands for sequence function, to do that. And we want it to go every five starting from zero. So the SEQ function would return zero, five, ten, etc., etc., all the way to 45. Uh, we're going to do something similar to that with the uh, y-axis because we want the breaks to go in units of 10 all the way up to like 90 because it looks like our max is just over 80 here. We want the limits to be from 0 to 50. So we want to manually specify this graph has limits that begin at 0. And we want to specify we want this graph to include the origin 0, 0. So this expand equals the vector C00. That's just telling it basically begin at that point 00. So let's do this. Bam, all these uh, issues are cleared up. This graph begins at the origin, both on the y-axis and the x-axis. It begins at 00. Our limits go from 0 to 45, and our limits go from 0 to uh, 90. Excuse me, the limits go from 0 to 50, and the breaks go from 0 to 45. So this looks beautiful. Then the last graph that I'm going to show you how to create using ggplot2 is the box plot. So with the box plot, you have to specify an X variable and a Y variable because we're basically visualizing the distribution of one variable as it relates to another one. So if we create this box plot, we have class on the X axis and we have city, that is city miles per gallon on the Y axis. Now I've specified for this X variable to map that to fill as well because I want a different color for each of these different classes as we go from the X axis axis from left to right. So this is a very visually appealing graph. Now something you're going to find yourself wanting to do in ggplot2 pretty often is creating different graphs, one for each level of a different variable. Now the tool for this is called facets and we're going to use a function called facet wrap to do this. So just to show you the variable that we're going to use in the MPG dataset, if we look up here, we have this variable called CYL. That's the cylinders of all the individual uh, vehicles. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create different box plots 
a set of box plots for each individual level of the CYL variable. So we're going to use this function facet wrap, and the syntax for this is you're going to specify under the argument facets the variable that you want to create wrappings for. Uh, and it's going to be, be followed by this tilde symbol here. And you can specify the number of rows and columns. And then, bam. We've got here a set of box plots for CYL equals 4. Another set for CYL equals 5. That's pretty sparse because there's not a whole lot of five-cylinder vehicles out there. Another for CYL equals six. Another for CYL equals eight. So this is an incredibly powerful and flexible way that you can create multiple graphs all inside one single graph. Now that you see how useful facets are, let's go on to another feature of ggplot2, and that's coordinate systems. So I gotta be honest, I do not use these a whole lot because there's not a lot of practical instances in which you'll really need to, but probably the most common one is chord polar that helps you convert to polar coordinates, and then also chord flip, which we're going to see here. So in this graph, we're going to start by creating a basic bar chart. Uh, it's pretty easy if you see the actual graph here, but we specify with the bar chart we want class to go to the x-axis, and then the color of the bars is going to be specified by the CYL variable. And we're going to add some labels here, so we want the title of the graph to be labeled cylinders by class, and then the color, that is what's actually going to go to the legend here, is going to be specified with uh, cylinders. So if we add chord flip to the end here, we have count on the x-axis and the class on the y-axis. So even though we specified class was going to go to the x-axis, you would have seen count going to the y-axis, but the chord flip just flips all of that. So now we have a bar chart here instead of a column chart. And because we specified that the fill was going to come from the CYL variable, we have a stacked bar chart. You might not care for stacked bar charts that much though, and maybe you want to see those things side by side. So you can use another functionality called position to change this thing inside of ggplot2. So in our example here, we're going to run a very similar chunk of code, except we're going to add the argument position equals dodge to all of this. And now the position adjustment is not something that I do, again, in ggplot2 a whole lot, because oftentimes I don't really need to. So there are a few different examples, and you can see all these examples of position adjustment inside the ggplot2 cheat sheet. But when we specify position equals dodge here, that's going to put these things side by side. So now these individual levels of cylinders, they're all on top of each other or side by side if we weren't doing the chord flip transformation here. And we have this kind of layout instead of just having a stacked bar chart. So it's convenient and it'll help you customize to get the kind of graph that you want. And now the last thing that I'm going to show you how to do in this tutorial is to change the theme of the graph. Now there's a default look and feel to these ggplot2 graphs, but this is entirely customizable. So let's take a look at a graph that we created earlier in this tutorial. This is the box plots. So you've got your standard gray background, but maybe we want to get rid of these panel grid lines that are going on here. Let's also get rid of these axis ticks that are here under class. And also let's give this thing a uh, labeled title, put it right in the center and make it a little bit bigger. So the code for how you would do that is up here, but I gotta be honest, sometimes it's really hard to remember this syntax, and even though you can just run question mark theme and get all this syntax, it can be a little bit of a pain. And that's where GG Theme Assist is an incredibly useful package. So if you have the GG Theme Assist package installed and loaded, then if you go up here to add-ins, you can go to ggplot theme assistant. And what this is going to do is, it's going to open up a bit of a, a guided user interface for you. So you're gonna see your graph up here above here, and there are a variety of things that we can basically go through and change here. So the grid major and the grid minor lines, I wanna get rid of them. We're gonna set those to blank. Bam, you can see these things changing on the graph here. You can go over here to settings and you can change the width and the height of the graph. 
you can go over here to axis and then, then you can change the axis text on both the X and the Y axis, as well as just some overall features like the family, face, size, and things like that. I mentioned I wanna get rid of these little axis ticks, so let's set that to blank. Bam, we see those have disappeared. And I wanted to modify the title. Now, if we go over here, you can specify a, a title here. I'm just gonna call it box plot example. Then for the face here, I'm going to change that to bold because I want that to stick out. I want to make that a little bit bigger. And then under H just here, we're going to set that to 0.5 so that it's centered. Bam. We do that. We hit done. And then would you look at that? So ggplot theme assistant automatically wrote all the code in order to do this. So if we just run this here, Guess what? We have reproducible code. And would you look at that? Now, ggplot2 is an incredibly flexible and powerful package. And to be honest, newcomers to R can kind of struggle with this package at first, just because the syntax to it can be kind of weird. And there's so much that you can do with this package. So I strongly recommend going to the cheat sheet, figuring out where everything is, and then just taking some time to run through some of the examples on that cheat sheet. Once you've figured out the intuition and the feel and the syntax for ggplot2, you're going to be amazed how quickly and how easily you can create really good looking graphs. And it's honestly going to be a huge motivator for you if you're just getting started with R for the first time. So thanks for watching this tutorial. If you found it helpful, please consider sharing it. Also, once again, smash the like button. And then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.